Hey guys, today we're going to take a look at the Netgear WAX610 wireless access point. This is part of their AX1800 series, meaning it has a maximum theoretical throughput of 1800 megabits per second. Now, last week I reviewed the WAX214 wireless access point, and I left that video somewhat disappointed both in terms of the functionality available and some of the connectivity issues I ran into. Now, since that video, I've been running a pair of these WAX610 access points for several days now, and I've had nothing but solid, reliable performance. And I'm thrilled to finally have a replacement for these old dinosaur uh, access points I was using before. This video will be a quick look at the access point itself, and then we'll take a detailed look at the software and the configuration options available. Before we get started, please hit that like button down below and help get this video noticed. Now this access point is part of their cloud managed insights platform thing. Um, I won't be using any of that. They do not require you to use the cloud management. There is a local configuration option. And to my knowledge, the only functionality you lose by not using their cloud management is the ability to create a mesh network. Taking a look at the device itself, this is a very nice, small and compact design. I really like the design of these access points. This measures six and one third inches across, six and one third inches in height, and it has a thickness of only one and one third inch. Taking a look at the front here, we have a few LEDs. The first is a power status or cloud connectivity indicator. We have an ethernet indicator, and we have LEDs for the 2.4 and five gigahertz wireless as well. On the back of the device here, we have two holes for mounting to a wall. We also have a slot where you can slide in a mounting plate. This does come with a mounting plate for like a ceiling or a T-bar style drop ceiling. We have a 12 volt 2.5 amp power input here. This is a standard DC barrel jack. And then we have our ethernet port here, which is a 2.5 gig uplink. And it's also good for PoE or power over ethernet, 802.11AT. And then lastly, we have our little pinhole for the factory reset button. And since this device is power over ethernet, you simply grab your ethernet cable, plug it in, and it'll boot up in a few minutes. All right, so once this device starts up, we can see the various color LEDs here. So the status LED will be green when the status is good. It will turn blue when it's connected to the cloud. The LAN LED, you see mine is orange. My switch is only one gig, so I have an orange LED. If you have a 2.5 gig connection, you'll see green. And then the final two indicators, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, uh, they will turn green when they're on and they will turn blue when there's a client connected. All right, in order to access the configuration of your device, you simply need a standard web browser and the IP address of your device. You can log in using your administrative username and password that you created during the initial configuration. We can see a bit of basic information about our access point, including the location. I named mine AP-Hallway. We've got the MAC address, serial number, uptime firmware, and last firmware check. The number of clients connected, again, there are four connected. And uh, it's reporting one of those as Windows and three of those as Others. Uh, so first we're going to go to Configuration, System, Basic, and then the Management Mode tab. And uh, I just wanted to point out in here that when you do the initial configuration of your access point, you'll be asked to pick between Cloud Remote Management Mode or Local Management Mode. And if you want to change those at any time for any reason, you can do that in here. You don't have to do a factory reset of your access point. I don't plan to ever do anything cloud related. I don't like cloud things. I don't see any reason why my access point configuration has to be stored in the cloud. Maybe if I have like 50 of these things, but if I've got two, the first thing you'll want to do when you log into your access point for the first time is go to maintenance, upgrade, and firmware upgrade. You will want to make sure right away that your device is at the latest and greatest firmware. You see I'm at 10307 currently. Um, this access point did ship with an older firmware, and uh, if you're at 9615 or older, you will not be able to use the automated upgrade here. So what I actually had to do is go out to the Netgear website, and I downloaded 9626, which you can see is the backup firmware. I manually upgraded to 9626, and then at that version, you can begin using the automated upgrade here. So if you're at 9615 or earlier, you will likely receive an error if you try to click upgrade now. Um, I just wanted to point that out because it did take me a little bit of troubleshooting at the beginning to figure out why I couldn't uh, get the firmware installed. So other than that, I'm just going to go through some of these tabs and show you some of the configuration options and what I have configured. Um, under the advanced tab, you can see we've got some information for spanning tree. Uh, the syslog tab, if you have a centralized syslog server, you can configure the device to ship the logs off to that. LLDP is on by default. I would recommend you keep that on. That's going to be used for PoE negotiation. And it's also going to show you some information on your switch about the device, which we'll take a look at here shortly. 
um, UPnP, we don't need any of that. LED, if you want your LEDs to shut off on your device, uh, at nighttime when it is dark in the house, they do look like strobe lights. So if that bothers you, um, you may want to come in here and switch off your LEDs. Uh, we have the IP configuration. Mine is currently set to DHCP. If you want to assign a static IP address, you can do that in here. Uh, this device also supports VLAN tagging for the management interface. So under the wireless settings here, under basic, is where we can configure the various SSIDs. You can put up to eight SSIDs on this access point. Uh, then we have the wireless settings tab, which are global across all of your SSIDs. Basically the modes of operation for 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, the channel width. Um, I typically recommend channel width be set to 20 megahertz for the 2.4 and 80 megahertz for the 5. Some devices can support 160 megahertz, so if your device does support 160, uh, feel free to select that. So there are a number of settings available on this WAX610 that were not available on the WAX214. And that is what I like to see. I don't like how the WAX214 was so restrictive. Um, so I don't have any reason to change any of these settings really, but they are available here if you would like to take a look. Going back to the basic tab, uh, you can see I've got two primary SSIDs set up. I have home and guest, and then I have my old SSID, which I'll be migrating off shortly. Uh, but if I expand one of these, um, they are all set to WPA3 slash two. Uh, there's a number of authentication settings in here. It does support enterprise authentication as well. Um, I have mine VLAN tagged as 10. My guest network will be VLAN tagged as 20. Pre-shared key, you can set that here. Band steering, I decided to leave this disabled. Uh, band steering will encourage clients to shift to the five gigahertz if your client supports it. I believe it does that by adjusting the beacon interval, if I recall, I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, we have this operating in bridge mode. That means it's bridging the Wi-Fi and the LAN interfaces together. You can operate it in NAT mode if you want. I definitely don't recommend that. I would rather have my, you know, address translations and port forwards and stuff like that happening on the router, not the actual access point. Wireless client isolation is basically going to force the traffic to go back to your switch. Uh, rather than allowing the access point to switch traffic between multiple connected wireless devices. I left that disabled. Again, if you want a more restrictive environment, you can certainly enable that as well. Advanced rate selection, I don't really need to worry about anything in there. My guest access point is pretty much configured the same. I've got a different passphrase for it, obviously, and then it's tagged with a different VLAN ID. Uh, the security tab has a number of options I haven't really used. The URL filtering, the the radius if you're in an enterprise environment and you've got a radius authentication server. Uh, neighboring AP will look for uh, access points around your vicinity. Wireless bridging is one thing the 214 did not support that I'm glad to see on the 610. Um, this basically allows your access point to act as a repeater for an existing wireless network and it also allows your access point to act as a bridge or a client to another access point. So if you've got like a detached garage or something and you can't run a cable from your house to your garage, you can simply put this access point in your garage, turn it into bridge mode, and then it will act as a client of an existing network to extend your network out to that separate building. So if we take a look at the monitoring menu and the system tab here, we have more information than what was presented to us on the dashboard page. We've got all of the MAC addresses for the various interfaces. Our current power source is 802.3AT. We have LLDP enabled, as I mentioned earlier, and it's identified the partner device or the device it's plugged into as an HPE, 292048G switch. And we have the connected clients page here, which will show what's connected to your access point. I've got three, four devices connected currently, and that will break it down between 2.4 and five gigahertz. Uh, so if we take a look at these devices, it shows a number of details. And the longer they are connected to your access point, uh, the more details it will gather. It will change these OSs from unknown, um, and it will collect the host name as well. So I believe this one here is my phone. So if I click on that, uh, you can see quite a bit of information about that connection. And we can see our connection right here is 648 transmit, 288 receive. This is pretty impressive because this uh, device is on a separate floor than the access point. So the access point is on my first floor and I'm currently down in the basement and I'm still getting these kind of throughputs. And we have the signal strength indicator here as well. Taking a look at the logs, we have detailed logs for debugging purposes and you can actually download the detailed logs. Uh, it will spit out a zip file with pretty much every log the system has, uh, significantly more information than what's contained in this page here. Wireless bridge mode, if you have a bridge set up, again, mine are currently disabled. But if we go back to the configuration area here, 
and you're going to set up the SSID of the point you're connected to, and you can also set the MAC address of the remote device you'll be connected to, primarily to prevent uh, your device from associating with rogue APs. It's just an extra layer of security. So we've got the remote management page here. SNMP is disabled by default. If you want that on, you can set up your SNMP information. Um, there is supposed to be an SSH option here, and I'm surprised I'm not seeing it, and I don't know why I'm not seeing it. So uh, I'm going to have to look into that a little bit more. Uh, very basic diagnostics. We have packet capture, ping test, and a speed check. And the speed test is reporting 233 down and 23 up, which is pretty good because I'm paying for 200 down and 20 up. So I'm getting quite a bit more than I'm paying for there. Other than that, that's pretty much all there is to see in the administrative interface here. Uh, so I did want to show you my switch as well, just to show you the kind of information that you can see in here. Uh, this is an HPE 292048G. So if I do a show LLDP info remote devices, uh, you can see both of the access points here. We have AP hallway and AP laundry room. Uh, and those are connected to port 6 and 21 on the switch. So none of this information is programmed into the switch. It's all done through LLDP. That's why I definitely recommend keeping that enabled, especially if you have a deployment with maybe 10 of these access points. Um, it's very quick to come into your switch and just do a show information and find out which ports they're on and the locations of those devices so you're not mixing them up. So the VLAN configuration is fairly simple as well. If I do show VLAN ports, we're on 6 comma 21. So for both of these ports, they are running on the native VLAN. Again, I don't have a management VLAN. Uh, and then I have VLANs 10 and 20, home and guests are tagged on both interfaces. And then if we take a look at the power consumption, we'll do show power over ethernet and we'll take a look at port number six here. That's the AP hallway. So our power negotiation was done using LLDP, as you can see here, it's requested 25 and a half watts. It's currently delivering 56.8 volts at 6.9 watts. So that's, that's not a lot of power to run these access points. Now, if you're pushing and pulling a lot of traffic through it, the more utilization on your access point, obviously the more power consumption you're going to see. The other one was on port 21. So the other one's consuming about the same, again, requested 25.5 watts and it's pulling 6.7 watts. All right, so we've covered pretty much everything I can think of on the Netgear WAX610 wireless access point. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those down below, or if there's anything else you guys want to see. I'd also like to know what you guys think about these format videos. I try not to keep talking on and on and on, but at the same time, I want to get as much detail in as I can when reviewing a piece of equipment like that. That's one thing that bothers me as a viewer when I'm looking to purchase a product and I can't find detailed information on YouTube. So yeah, please let me know what you think and if there's any other equipment, server, or networking related that you'd like to see me review. Otherwise, hit that like button before you go and thanks for watching.